Can I can I warmly welcome everyone uh, today? We've still got people arriving through the virtual door. We're up to 52 so far, so it's going uh, well. It's a good thing we're vir virtual, otherwise we'd all have to keep the windows open. Um, people will know, of course, uh, in Britain, Boris Johnson has announced belatedly that we're going to go into a lockdown in England on Thursday. In Wales, as you can see the flag behind me, we've been on a fire break uh, and we're going into the last week of that. And the hope is that we'll be going back to some sort of normality after that. But everybody knows that uh, the big issue today is COVID. Um, we're here, of course, to talk about um, air quality. Now, we know in the world, there's something like 7 million people are dying a year from air quality prematurely. In the in Britain, it's something like 64,000 people uh, through a mixture of heart, uh, lung and brain disorders. And some of the latest research, which builds on previous studies, shows that in terms of coronavirus, uh, last week we heard from the Max Planck Institute in Germany that they estimated some 15% of additional COVID deaths are due to uh, air pollution. Uh, a lot of this, of course, is due to people being uh, you know, weaker and more predisposed towards dying from a respiratory uh, a neurological problem, having been exposed to air pollution already. So that they reckon that we're talking about an extra 6,000 deaths there. So it really does underline the need for us to tackle uh, air pollution as part of the strategy out of coronavirus, but in general, as a sort of chronic problem of uh, industrial scale death and bad health, both mentally and uh, physically. Uh, we're here to focus on schools. Obviously, the schools in England will be open during lockdown. So it's imperative that people's air is kept clean. And that uh, varies from going to school, walking and cycling, preferably. Obviously, if you're in public transport, it's important to be wearing masks and to be socially uh, distanced. Uh, then outside schools, it's important that parents aren't sitting in cars with running engines to keep warm whilst polluting the air outside and polluting uh, you know, our children. Uh, indoors, uh, clearly there's an issue around uh, indoor air pollution. Uh, people will know that we spend over 90% of our times in normal times indoor and there's chemicals, uh, be, be they volatile organic compounds or other chemicals coming out of building materials. There's chemicals coming out of cleaning sprays and uh, uh, and basically sprays people wear on themselves as well and all these are in fact problematic in terms of air pollution uh, combining with outdoor air pollution causing a cocktail that causes respiratory problems um, the the latest research on it because covid shows that um, the virus will spray uh, 50 times as much if you are talking as or shouting or singing as if you're you're simply sitting there not making a, a noise, uh, and that underlines the need for schools, in my view, certainly, and in the from the science to look towards wearing masks in schools. Um, in Japan, for example, and other places, uh, students simply do wear masks in schools. The 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 basic the, the factors involved in the spread of coronavirus of course are aren't very much so much touching materials that coronavirus is on or touching it's mainly through the air that we're now finding uh, and it depends on how close you are for how long and whether you're in an unventilated space so the first thing according to the world health organization of course is to keep the windows open to keep a ventilated space to keep a certain amount of distance and if at all possible to wear masks as i've already mentioned um, obviously we're here to discuss these not all these things will be done but minimally uh, there should be ventilation and staggered entry to the school there's also been discussions about whether if a school was open for five days, uh, the people, uh, the a normal people would only be there, for example, for four days, then it would reduce 20% uh, of the pupils in the school at the time to increase social distancing. Some have suggested that there's more home learning. Some of these issues are controversial, but I think what minimally we're saying is that uh, think about minimizing chemicals, think about maximizing ventilation, think about uh, social distancing, and think about uh, avoiding people assembling close together. And finally, um, 
uh, at the moment, uh, the air quality, of course, is legally binding through EU legislation in Britain. But after January, there will be no legally binding uh, pollution limits for the United Kingdom. And our opportunity in legislation is to build into the Environment Bill uh, legally binding limits, in particular the World Health Organization, a limit of uh, 10 micrograms per cubic meter for PM 2.5 by 2030. And I would urge people here to write to their MPs and get to others to write to their MPs, urging them that these limits are put on the face of the Environment Bill alongside a duty on the Secretary of State to consider, at least on an annual basis, uh, strategies to improve indoor air quality. Uh, if schools and pupils and parents and others across Britain and elsewhere, you know, write to the MP saying, look, if you're taking this seriously, we want these legal limits uh, in, imposed, uh, introduced uh, and in the Environment Bill. So there's legally enforceable limits to have an infrastructure. Otherwise, we'll end up with the situations we have now that, from, that there will be no targets until 2022. When those targets are introduced, they can be changed at whim by the um, by the Secretary of State for the Environment, and there will be no legal enforceability. Everybody in this room, uh, this virtual room, takes this issue massively seriously, and I hope uh, you, you'll use this window of opportunity to to actually put pressure on members of Parliament to do the right thing. So anyway, without further ado, that was a very happy start, wasn't it? <laughs> Can I? Uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, Chris Large, who's the uh, Chief Executive Officer. Or global action plan and i'm very pleased to say that they have been the ones who have administered uh, this particular meeting so without further ado over to you chris oh, just in time thanks uh, thanks Geraint, and thank you very much for inviting us to uh, to take part in this discussion on which is an absolutely vital topic and so um, i'm going to introduce the topic um by taking you through a, a few slides of introduction, which um, will lay out the, um, the challenges as we, uh, as we understand them in ensuring that children in all schools have clean air. And so, um, and then I'll hand over to um, experts in the field that we have joined uh, with us today. Um, so to, first of all, to begin with those who are unfamiliar with Global Action Plan, um, we focus on clean air as a subject because it's a vital environmental issue, a health issue, there's a social justice um, issue here at play as well, and it's also an economic challenge um, with increasing evidence showing how air pollution uh, reduces the economic output of the UK. And the way that Global Action Plan uh, approaches this subject is really to look at the positives of uh, overcoming air pollution not just um, the benefits that um, we will have to our health, but so many other benefits that we would want for society, ranging from fewer road accidents through to better connected cities with a lower level of loneliness and more green space. And as we've perhaps seen with the increase in homeworking recently, even more sleep uh, in our lives, which uh, I'm sure I won't uh, meet many people who will complain about having more sleep. And final introduction to, to GAP, these are the sorts of activities that you find us doing. We might um, be implementing systemic advances to, um, to air pollution, such as the Clean Air Hospitals Framework, which um, was launched with Great Ormond Street, where we found um, uh, hundreds of ways in which hospitals could improve uh, air quality. We run public communications activities and we're delighted to uh, convene Clean Air Day. Uh, recently, we had the fourth Clean Air Day campaign. And we also um, uh, have a political influence avenue through the media and through direct engagement with politicians. And so this is the reason um, why we are having this conversation today. And um, the issue uh, that we have for school children is one that is harm to their health. It is also uh, increasingly understood that it is a harm to their learning, as well as the equality challenge that the schools that have the largest attainment gap are the ones that are also more likely to be exposed to high levels of air pollution. And you will hear from uh, 
Luke Munford at the University of Manchester as, uh, as to recent research on the learning, um, uh, the learning impingement that air pollution brings. We also know that there is a serious challenge. Over 27% of schools in the UK are in situations where the air pollution is above World Health Organization recommended limits. And there is no national uh, protection plan for schools in the UK. Uh, the picture here you'll see is, is a, a, an artist that we work with called Sarah Sturk, who has um, looked at sputum samples, spit samples of children. They looked at this exercise of hacking up um, uh, samples from as deep down as they can go and splitting those into a nice Petri dish and you can see pollution. It's very difficult to make pollution visible, but here we can see pollution that has come from uh, children's bodies. If you look at the picture here of um, the, one, the, the piece that looks a bit like a purple fried egg with a, the, the purple center, right above that purple center, there are um, perfectly black dots. And those black dots are particulate matter pollution um, that uh, children in London have uh, coughed up from uh, the in with their sputum samples, just to bring home how important it is that we tackle this problem. The final thing I wanted to lay out in this introduction are uh, some of the, the opportunities and the solutions that we feel are vital to, uh, to address this challenge. So on the practical measures, first of all, um, traffic restrictions, modal shift around how we get children to school, and combating other local high emission sources are going to be vital to ensure that children have clean air in every school in the country. We would like every school to have a clean air plan and um, we'd like support to be delivered to the schools that most need help. And that support can come through many different avenues. Ourselves and other NGOs are already directly um, helping schools who have got obviously a lot of um, uh, issues to, to cope with at the moment, given the COVID crisis. Thirdly, um, and Sheila will, will talk more about this uh, later on, um, we, we think children's voices are a vital uh, tool in bringing about change. Um, fourthly, there are some very practical measures that are needed across the school estate from the school building policy incorporating um, uh, the right measures in the way that schools are built through to um, retrofitting um, filtration, perhaps screening, um, and also an improvement in boilers. There's a whole host of measures that we've identified in the Clean Air Schools framework are needed to protect schools um, from air pollution. Additional funding is certainly going to be needed. Finally, um, we do need that national plan where we share solutions um, between cities so that schools and individual local authorities are not left to figure out the best ways of uh, the best pollution abatement measures that, uh, that would best protect schools and that that national plan is, is appropriately funded and targeted so that the schools with the uh, greatest pollution problem are helped first. Um, and Gemma will talk about this later on, um, but we have created and, and released in the last few months um, a tool called the Clean Air Schools Framework. It is free, you can download it now if you search online for Clean Air Schools Framework, and it will help any school create a bespoke clean air plan for that school. And um, head teacher Steve, who you'll also hear from later on, has been in instrumental in helping us figure out the right things to include in that framework. So that's all from me, and I will hand back to uh, Geraint to take us through uh, our, our panel of speakers today. Thanks very much, Chris, that was fantastic. Um, uh, now it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Luke Munford of Manchester University. Uh, I think uh, without further ado, it's over to you, Luke. Thank you very much, um, Chair. So I'd like to talk to people today about some research we've recently done here at Manchester funded by Global Action Plan and the Phillips Foundation trying to give us an idea of what might happen to children's work and memory, which we know is a really good predictor of future education attainment, if we can alter pollution in and around uh, primary schools. So we started by looking at the literature that already exists um, between these links of, of air pollution and executive function, particularly among primary age school children. 
And as I said, this is important because ex executive function has been such been shown to be such a strong determinant factor of educational attainment. Really important to look at these um, associations. So we found nine previous studies that had investigated this relationship, um, and these studies covered a range of different countries, different contextual backgrounds. They considered pollution in different ways, and they also looked at um, executive function in different ways as well. So there's a lot of um, evidence, and the main prevailing finding was that if you increase pollution, then you essentially decrease executive function of children, which will then lead on to reduced education attainment. So what we found was that there is a lot of evidence to say that increased pollution is bad for the executive function of children. So then what we wanted to do is use the existing evidence to allow us to try and predict what we think could happen um, to work in memory if we alter pollution by given amounts in and around school in England and particularly in, in Greater Manchester. And what we did was we considered pollution in two ways. So we looked at outdoor air pollution, um, which we use NO2 to measure, and also indoor air pollution, which we measure by PM2.5. The choice of pollutants doesn't really affect the main um, message, it's just the things we decided to go over. So what we found is if you did nothing to pollution, then children's executive function will increase year on year because we know children's brain develops um, as the age. But if you reduce pollution by 20%, you get an additional 6% improvement in the work and memory of children. If you reduce it by 30%, you um, get an additional 9% improvement in the work and memory and executive function of children. And a 50% reduction in pollution will in, improve the um, work and memory of children by around about 15%, uh, 15 Each of these numbers has some confidence intervals around because these are just estimates, but it never includes zero. So we are confident that if you reduce pollution, you will get meaningful and statistically significant improvements in work and memory of children. If we assume there's a linear growth in work and memory, um, we can look at the, the outcomes of children at various time points. So if you did nothing, you get this um, the solid black line. If you reduce pollution by 20%, you get the, the middle dotted line. If you reduce pollution by 50%, you get the top um, long dash, short dash line. And what we, we predict will happen is if you reduce pollution by 20%, the work and memory of children will increase or will benefit by around about three weeks in, in every year. And if you reduce pollution by 50%, it's a sort of seven and a half to eight weeks worth of additional improvements in, in work and memory of children in primary school. So to summarize, summarize what we found, a 20% reduction in outdoor pollution will improve um, work and memory by about 6%, or equivalent to three, work, three weeks worth of growth per year. If you reduce pollution by 50%, then these improvements increased about 15% or around seven to eight weeks worth of growth a year. The results when we look at indoor air pollution are incredibly similar. So it, it, the choice of pollutant or whether we consider indoor and outdoor um, um, exposures doesn't really affect the results. What we haven't done is looked at if you simultaneously reduce indoor and outdoor, then we'd expect the results to be bigger still and probably bigger than uh, the sum of the parts, but we haven't um, considered that for now. I think the key takeaways from the research we did was that if you reduce air pollution, then you will get improvements in work and memory of children. And this is incredibly important for their educational attainment. And we know that educational attainment is so predictive of, of all life course events of people as the age. So getting this investment right in children can have really long and pronounced um, life course um, benefits for these children. So thank you very much. Right, well, that was uh, fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, as you see, it seemed to have gone orange. But, uh, don't worry about that. It must be the tango I'm drinking. Now, I'd like to uh, to with that, that was a fantastic presentation, and I think it just gives us uh, all the more motivation to make the changes that we all want to see to improve all our children's life chances. So, can I now, um, without further ado, turn to Sheila Watson of the FIA Foundation, Sheila? Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Grant. 
I'm trusting you can see my slides because none of the other panelists are growling at me. So I'm, I'm thinking I'm, I'm okay. Um, very go. quickly yep. to let you know uh, who I am and what the FIA Foundation is. We're a UK based philanthropy, a charity, uh, but we're very much globally facing. So um, our work is sometimes based in the UK, but largely is not. And one of the reasons why that is the case is because we, like everyone else and everyone on the panel, has a, have observed just how very bad air quality is everywhere, uh, particularly in cities around the world. Uh, and we focus a great deal of our work outside of the UK in support um, of a range of policies around safe and sustainable mobility to address that. Uh, and we support work uh, across a range of different aspects um, of uh, policy development and evidence gathering and so on in order to do that. Uh, and one of the core programs that we're supporting, which links directly to the issues we're discussing today is something called the Child Health Initiative. It's a global partnership of organizations like UNICEF and Save the Children uh, and lying behind the work that we do through that partnership is our toolkit. And that's a screenshot of it. And I mention it because in many ways it builds on what Chris was just describing in terms of the Global Action Plan Toolkit, uh, because it is globally facing, it draws together work from around the world. Uh, and the work that I'm about to describe to you is actually captured within that toolkit. And that's the project that we did, uh, supported and GAP carried out, um, this School Run Scandal um, Toolkit. Um, the work um, of this uh, toolkit was really intended to give voice to young people. One of the things that concerns us very much uh, is that in so many ways, the world in which our children are growing up into is one in which their voice is really not heard. And so we're very, very keen, not only to give voice to young people, but also where we can to enable them to learn and to understand and to question what they see in the world. Uh, and that's exactly what this school run scandal project was developed to do. Um, so although COVID, of course, somewhat got in the way, we were very excited uh, to learn that four schools were still able to engage. And I think we have Steve, one of the head teachers of, of one of those schools with us on this call. Um, and in those schools, uh, 61 students became um, investigators into the issue of how air quality uh, around them was being affected in particular by vehicles. Um, and they carried out a whole range of different uh, pieces of research in order uh, to fully understand what was going on. And the background uh, to one aspect of that was another project that we at FIA Foundation support, the True Initiative, uh, which basically seeks to show just how much so many vehicles um, emit on our roads over and above their tested values. Um, some of you will have heard of something called the Dieselgate scandal, the Volkswagen scandal in North America, where there was cheating involved um, in terms of emission levels. This project has tested vehicles around and across Europe and developed a three-part um, uh, evaluation of their emissions in relation to their tested levels. Uh, and it's either poor, moderate or good. When it's poor, it could be three times as much being emitted as should be. Um, and there are lots of reasons for that, not all, all of them in any way suspicious, but nonetheless, that's very important when you look at how you're ever gonna build policy if you don't know what's really going on. And I would encourage you to look at the true website. It's very rich, but um, way more than I can tell you about now. Um, and so one of the elements that the students using the School Run Scandal Kit looked at was the true rating. And they looked at their own cars. They looked at cars they saw on the streets outside the school. And they were very shocked to discover that around 70% of the vehicles they put through the rating system turned out to be poor or moderate. Um, and that meant the two thirds, more than two thirds really, were well above tested limits. And they were very shocked by that uh, and interested to learn more about what that told them about the way in which vehicles are, are advertised and how they're informed about this. And was this something you would see if you were to look at uh, the advert, advert for, for, for a vehicle that's someone's trying to sell to you. And so this was another aspect of the investigation that they undertook. They looked at lots of adverts. Um, and I think uh, we know that a very small proportion of advertising ever focuses on low carbon vehicles anyway. Um, and the children of course observed that too. The students were very clear that that was something 
that they weren't seeing much advertising of low carbon options and certainly not much mention of excess emissions or the impact on air quality. And um, that motivated many of the students to pick up a pen uh, or to uh, get to a keyboard and write a letter to the um, manufacturers or uh, uh, of, of these vehicles um, to let their views be heard. So they took the evidence, they questioned what they were seeing and they were motivated to write. And I think as the consumers of the future, uh, these, you know, the manufacturers ought to be concerned and interested in what the views of the kids were. And indeed they were, and I believe some of the vehicle uh, manufacturers who had letters through the School Run Scandal project actually responded. And I know, um, and we have this quote here from one of the teachers engaged in the project, that the students felt that they learned a lot through this work uh, and they did exercise their voice in the letters and they were pleased when they, when they received a response. So we were delighted to support this work. We didn't undertake it, I should be clear, the research was carried out by Global Action Plan, uh, but we're very pleased to see this example of giving young people a voice in this debate about what impacts our air quality, greater understanding, evidence they could interrogate. And this piece of research is now part of that toolkit that I referred to earlier. And we'll be looking at how we can do more work like this elsewhere around the world, because tragically, this is a problem for children way beyond our city. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, having a few minutes to describe that to you. But if you want to know more, please check out the Child Health Initiative website. There's tons more detail in there. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila, that's fantastic uh, again. And now uh, I think we've got Gemma, haven't we, McHenry from the Philip Foundation to say a few words, if I'm not mistaken. Gemma? Brilliant, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Let me share my screen. I'm gonna assume that's showing, is everyone, can everyone see that? Yes, brilliant, thank you. Yes. Um, let me, uh, very, very um, happy to be here today, delighted, because uh, on the behalf of Philips Foundation, that was set up to help the underserved and underprivileged communities around the world, and in this case, the children in the UK. And when we began this programme, I was very shocked to learn how much air pollution affects every organ in the body the brain, the lungs, the heart. So this really does need to be recognized and taken very seriously as we all do um, on, the, on the panel here is the biggest environmental health issue of our time that we can choose to do something about. Phillips took a stand on this issue because there are over 2000 schools, nurseries and other education centers in the UK in air pollution hotspots. That's where the air quality does not meet the acceptable limits of the World Health Organization with children playing and learning in toxic air, it's just not acceptable. So whilst it's great that the government have put bills in place, as we've uh, mentioned today, uh, to address this issue, it will still take 20 to 30 years for this to come into play and that's generations affected. And indoor air quality is not on the environmental bill yet. So whilst we know it's up to five times worse, and it's really upsetting to, to know that children are especially vulnerable to the effects of toxic air because of their organs and their immune systems are still developing. So I had a personal uh, wow moment uh, in setting up this program um, when I asked the children in the first workshop uh, in the first school how many used inhalers and a third of the hands were put up. And then I asked them if they knew anyone else in their family or outside of school that used inhalers and nearly half of the hands went up. So it made it very real as an issue to me in that moment. Um, but also in every workshop thereafter, I saw a very similar picture, which was worrying. And part of the way through when um, I went into the schools to check on the air purifiers that we'd installed um, as part of the inf intervention testing, uh, part of the program, and as you can see on the screen there, the, the amount of dirt and dust and general grime that had been captured by the purifiers, uh, it just shows you what's in the air and it shows you what the, what the children and teachers are breathing. 
So I'm proud to be part of setting this programme up with Global Action Plan and with the University of Manchester. Um, we set out with the aim of equipping all schools with the tools and resources to empower change and to um, give them the chance to change their environments. And on Clean Air Day this year, when we launched the, the framework, this made it possible. So since October last year, we've engaged with 6,500 students and teachers from 19 schools across Greater Manchester, which is one of the most air polluted areas in the UK. And I'll just tell you a bit about the program. We carried out STEM based clean air workshops and school assemblies uh, around the importance of reducing or preventing air pollution. And we carried out a series of interventions to inform the framework. One of these was to install the 10 air, Philips air purifiers around school in classrooms and communal areas. And we showed the teachers how to use them and we showed the children how they worked. And it was fantastic to see how fascinated they were in the technology. Um, and the children were amazed when the purifiers sensed the change in the air quality and cleaned it in front of them. And it was brilliant to see how engaged they were in learning about air pollution and how keen they are to get involved. We gave each school a learning resource pack full of STEM activities relating to air pollution to help teachers to build the topic into the curriculum after the workshop. And what we found, um, we, we've mentioned this already, um, but we published two findings really linked to the program. Um, and one was reinforcing the link between air pollution and the harm on children's lungs. If we can reduce air pollution by 50%, we'd halve the amount of children suffering from lung function issues around the country. And second, when air pollution increases by 20%, it stunts their ability to learn. Um, this is the equivalent of pulling a child out of school for a month every year. So it's quite shocking. Um, and in regards to the air purifiers, we, for a short period of time, we can reduce PM 2.5 air pollutants by up to 30% as one of an effective uh, ways to clean indoor air and and that's part of the framework and amongst other interventions that can be done to to improve the environment so in summary um, we took everything we learned and we created the free clean air for schools framework which every school in the UK can use to improve the air in and around their schools uh, we tested it with teachers head teachers local authorities and academics um, so it is really amazing to be able to provide schools with real solutions that can make a difference today. It makes me feel better to know that my children's school can access this framework and uh, feel enabled to make changes. And it's amazing to be able to provide um, this for them. Um, but it does concern me that more needs to be done to support schools on this journey and and the government and local authorities need to consider this. Now more than ever, we question what's in our air from pollutants to allergens to bacteria and viruses. And we need to, as building back to better, this framework should be part of a new protocol for schools to address the rising need to keep children and teachers health and uh, so safe and healthy. Indoor air targets and standards need to be included on the environmental bill and that relationship between indoor and outdoor air needs to be addressed in particular and Ofsted need to make clean air standard within the curriculum to encourage a basis of learning for each generation to come. Well, thank you very much for listening. Well, yeah, well, thank you very much, Gemma. That was fantastic and again, very inspiring and uh, shows us, you know, the need rate really, to take action both individually and collectively and lobby our MPs for these changes now. Uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to uh, now turn to Steve Marsland, the head teacher of Russell Scott Primary, to uh, give us an account from the chalk face. Over to you, Steve. Oh. A bit of trouble there, sorry. Yeah, it's all right. Where's my... Uh... Um, 
Thank you for inviting me today. Um, as a head teacher for 25 years, anecdotally, I've seen an increase in children's um, respiratory problems, and including my own. I come from the same town as I teach in. Um, I've been here all my life, 60 years, and I've got asthma now um, for the past couple of years. And just as Gemma was saying, um, when you do ask our children about asthma, you get an increase in hands year on year. Um, just to give you a bit of context, my school is in Denton, Tameside, one of the 10 Greats Manchester boroughs, um, and we're a northern mill town, famous for hats in its day, but also for smoke from its chimneys and its terrace rows. And we've paid a consequence for that since the Industrial Revolution, and we're paying a consequence now for increased uh, pollution from cars uh, coming past our school gates, other motorways that form our, our boundaries, and it's getting worse. And I like the, um, the anecdotal about the, the scandal of the school run. It is a scandal, it's a scandal for every school, and, it, and we're battling with it on our own, unfortunately. And we do, we take initiatives on and we try our best and we do, um, do what we're willing to do, which is everything we can to keep children's, children safe and their, their health well. But if we, don't, if we don't use a joined up approach with all our national uh, uh, and local planners, then we're just, I'm afraid, you know, we're just blowing in the wind. Just to give you an example, we're, we're, we're out every morning with our children and we believe in direct action. And our children speak to their, their own parents, telling them about the dangers of pollution um, around the school gates. And we do that every morning and every night. And we have clean air days. And we've got the Philips, um, the, the, the Philips filters in our classrooms. But just down the road, there's been a dispute between two councils over an extension, 90,000 square metre extension of a, an industrial facility in the Tame Valley, which is a, an area of national uh, recognition of beauty. Those trucks that are, that are going, to be, going to be servicing this, this huge extension come straight past our school down the M67 and, M, uh, and M60. So despite what we're doing, somebody somewhere is undermining it all. And, and it, it's governments, it's councils, it's local planning organisations that need to get a grip um, and protect our children's health and, and make it part of um, what we all do as communities. R rather than it being an add-on, this has got to be central. Clean air is a child's right. It's everybody's right, but a child in particular, they're, t they're bearing the consequences, consequences of this every single day. You know, we've, we've got two major motorways. We've got a retail park right next door to the school. We've got major arterial routeways that the children walk, walk to every morning. In the winter months, it's almost like a Lowry-esque painting with children against the, against the wind and the rain coming to school. And it's wrong. And until we all get together, and this is, this is what has really, really pleased me, no end in, in 25 years as ahead, is, is people getting together um, like we are today and it becoming important and it, it, it taking a, you know, a national step forward instead of individual schools working in isolation. Um, I've got a little clip here just to give you that context and show you what we are doing in terms of speaking to people, speaking to mums and dads, speaking to councils, having clean air days, getting the council to um, block off our streets on clean air day, just to show what differences this can make. And COVID, you know, probably the only thing that it's benefited us in is to show us what it's like without cars on the road and children walking to school without huge traffic jams to, to, to pass and to cross by. Uh, and that's probably the benefit that I've seen most during these difficult times being locked down. And, you know, we, we've been open since March, making sure our, our children are well educated and, and are fit and healthy. But all the same, if we didn't have these cars on the roads, we'd all be more fit and healthy. It's no coincidence that COVID is hitting these Northern towns like it is. You know, we've had generation after generation after generation of this pollution. Um, and we're, we're just living proof that we've got to make sure that the poorest, the poorest in society get as much as everybody else 
and unfortunately this COVID crisis in terms of people's health is hitting those northern towns that have had it for generations as I've said um, but anyway this is what we do this is what we've been doing for a while and I'm, I'm really glad that some of the things that we've been doing has been added onto the framework um, for clean air and we've been able to play just a little bit in making sure that, that um, the awareness is, is, is rising. Big, big traffic congestion all around the place. Right, well, that was uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, I'm going to open it up for questions. I mean, Steve's makes, uh, makes some uh, excellent points. There seems to be a bit of feedback on this. I don't know. I'll just say that there has been some data coming forward to show that uh, there's a relationship between COVID and uh, air pollution. And as has been mentioned, it would be interesting to know whether the, you know, the takeoff of COVID in the north, in particular in areas with particular pollution, there's a relationship there. Now, I want to uh, ask people to ask some questions. I'll take them in groups. Um, so can I start with uh, Diana Vraden? Uh, then I'll have uh, Dr. Rhys Thomas to make a quick comment. Dr. Diana, are you there? I think, uh, no. I don't know, this is. Uh, is that, uh, I'm hoping that um, Christiana is operating the mics. Now, uh, is Rhys Thomas there? Yeah, I've given him, right? Hi there. Hi there, Geraint. Hi. Thank you very much for... Uh, can you hear me, Geraint? I can, yeah. Far away, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Um, I was just wondering, um, it was a two-parter, really, of my questions. One of them is, uh, were the panelists aware that uh, the Chinese have installed UVC lighting in all their schools in China over the last six months? And um, wondering whether this could explain for the factors of how they managed to get on, uh, get such control of the virus and uh, reduce the spread of it. And the second thing was, is I, um, I'm sure the panelists are well aware of there's lots of evidence of viruses being able to take piggyback on particulates and be able to travel further from this. So with the government's policy of managing COVID indoors, of just open the window, do, do you think this is actually a good and sustainable policy going forward? Right, okay, and then I'll take, uh, is um, Diana there as well, or not? No, we'll take that first question. I think there has been some, uh, some, uh, some provisional research, isn't there, about the transmission on particulates of, um, of pollution, but I think that's, at the, at the moment, inconclusive. What we do know is that if people are ill from pollution, they're also more likely to get ill from uh, from COVID, 15%, according to the latest estimate. But is there anyone who wants to come back on that before I take the next question? It's a very interesting point to make. No, not this point. Uh, I've got John Fairburn, then Catherine Sutton. I don't, and I've got Christiana trying to enable them to speak. This is a sort of technological innovation on the move. So is, is John Fairburn there or Catherine Sutton? What about, oh, there's Catherine Sutton's son, his name suddenly come up. Are you about Catherine? <laughs> Operating from the moon. But um, what about Simon Burkett? No one can hold down Simon Burkett from. Hello, sorry. Oh, right, who's that? Is that Catherine? That's me again. <laughs> sorry about that. All right, okay. can you hear me? Make your comment or question. Okay, please. yeah, so my, it was just the comment was um, about allergens. So actually, um, it's not just um, chemicals in the indoor environment that are a problem, but it's inhaled allergens as well. And that is actually, after infancy, it's inhaled allergens, which are a major trigger for asthma. And then pollution adds on top of that. And I'm slightly concerned that there's never really a discussion about the allergens. All the, all the discussion is about the pollution. Well, it is part of the pollution, but it's sort of at the bottom, but it's a massive, 
it's quite a massive deal. If you speak to Allergy UK, um, <clears throat> up to 90% of childhood asthma is allergic. And then you have a virus. And then if you have the allergen present, that makes um, hospitalization for asthma 20 times more likely. So my, my concern is that, that this doesn't get discussed. Like the house dust mite allergen is actually the number one trigger for asthma, but it's rarely mentioned. Yeah, I th can I say, Catherine, that's uh, an excellent point. Uh, if you want to send me and others information about this, uh, my okay. understanding is that, um, that the level of allergies amongst children um, is much higher than amongst old people. And the level of the, the take up, if you like, of allergens is growing all the time and it's been linked to air pollution. In other words, air pollution creates people having this propensity to No, I, I think it's actually genetic and but it's it's been it's been made and so people have a, a dispensation or a predisposition to allergy but because we have more dust around we have more pollution and everything then you see it more in children nowadays than you would have years ago I, I you know I know this from personal experience and, and I, my child actually had an asthma attack in his school. Mm -hmm. It was from, you know, from the um, allergens in the school. Yeah, and Catherine, that's what I tried to show with uh, the dust and the dirt and the, yeah. the visual on my slide is it, whilst pollution and outdoor pollution does influence indoor air, there are other pollutions in there um, like the dust, like the allergens that uh, we, we need to consider as a total problem for indoor air. And that um, that does need to be addressed, like you say, is a very serious issue along with pollution um, in affecting people's respiratory um, conditions and causing them. So completely agree, both very serious uh, influences on people's health. And Geraint, if I can just come in on that question on the previous one. Um, this question of whether to open the windows or not and how to, how to control ventilation always crops up and it might sound a bit odd but I think it's really worth um, people at home and schools having a, uh, call it a window policy, a ventilation policy um, because it's not quite as easy as you might think. Um, indoor pollution, sources of pollution from indoors can build up so there's an argument for opening the windows but also in our in lots of our measuring experiments, we found that the level of indoor air pollution is um, highly correlated to the outdoor air quality. And so we have outdoor sources of pollution getting inside. So I think it's really worth thinking about you know, where, where are the windows? Are they facing the sources of pollution outdoors? Um, and therefore are those ones that are maybe to only open in certain times when it's not rush hour and those that are um, away from the busy road perhaps they're the ones that could be open much more frequently so um it might sound odd but it's really worth having a, a hard think about whether windows should be open or closed and think about the sources of indoor and outdoor pollution that's all included in the framework um the, the school's framework plan right that's excellent thank you for that chris and uh let's say that uh, as Catherine was saying there is a genetic predisposition towards our allergies of course but they can be triggered by dust and other pollution and we're seeing rates go up uh, very quickly so that younger people have more uh, allergies than their older counterparts. Now Simon Burkett, have we got Simon Burkett anywhere? Uh, yes I hope so, can you hear me? He is. Fantastic, right. fantastic session, uh, thank you all very much, it's uh, really great to be discussing this important topic. Uh, just a few points and questions, if I may. Uh, first is that um, uh, buildings can have ventilation, uh, air filtration and air conditioning or none of those. Um, so ventilation is just part of the, um, uh, the mixture. Uh, the second thing which actually sort of brings this sort of starkly um, home at the moment is we, we have a very high um, particle episode hitting the UK uh, later this week. Um, where the still air um, slight easterly winds will combine with festival bonfires and fireworks despite lockdown, I suspect. Um, so it is not always um, possible to, um, to just open windows. Um, uh, third, um, there is government guidance um, about um, uh, what to do in schools, which is BB 101. 
Uh, but even when it was produced two years ago, it was already out of date. Um, they introduced the wrong standards. Um, and I think it's absolutely shocking that this has not been updated. Um, uh, third, um, uh, I think it's um, uh, in relation to the question about China, um, I think UV filters um, uh, certainly have their place, they are valuable, uh, but I think they're most effective at treating problems on surfaces. Um, they don't deal with particles floating around in the air, including aerosols, uh, and air filters can reduce um, uh, particles, um, including COVID-19, by 99%. Uh, and the last point I would just make um, is that uh, if we fail to get indoor air uh, and WHO guidelines in the Environment Bill, uh, I think this gives us a, an extra reason to be pushing for a new Clean Air Act. Thank you very much. Well, that's very helpful, Simon. Is anyone wanted to comment on any of Simon's points? I would, I would say that his points are well made because in terms of this interface between COVID and um, air pollution itself, then uh, obviously we do need to think about particles outside and outdoor air pollution, opening windows into busy streets. And when there's a cloud of dust appearing, isn't it always a good idea? And that being said, on COVID alone, if the primary consideration in the short term is COVID spread in schools, there is still a case for opening windows. And normally, obviously, you've got clean air outside. There's an, an, an ambiguous case for opening the window. But with COVID, of course, there is an issue that you're better off opening windows, have it, um, basically having filters. And sometimes air conditioning can be problematic. But there we are. Um, Tom Lipinski. Is Tom Lipinski about? Hello, yes. Oh, great, Tom. Well, thank you. I, my, I do agree with, with your point that, that opening windows on balance is better than not opening windows when looking at COVID risk. It's just that my concerns were around uh, filters and, 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 and UVC. Uh, particularly when we talk about filters removing 99% of, of, of particulates and potentially COVID, we're obviously going, we're obviously talking about the air that is going through the filter itself, okay? And if we position that device anywhere in the room, it is unlikely to actually filter uh, more than 15 to 20% of the indoor air, unless it's running at something like, you know, four or five air changes per hour, in which case in a classroom, um, we'd be talking about uh, uh, 2000 cubic meters. So it would be a humongous device. Anything smaller than that will only just distribute the air around the classroom and mix it up. So everybody will be uh, breathing in everybody else's air, in which case it might actually be quite counterproductive when it comes to helping to prevent infection spread because it's effectively an air blender rather than an air filter. So that's, that's the concern number one. The concern number two is um, when it comes to UVC lighting, it, it's still carcinogenic and when it comes to skin exposure and, and it can blind people. So any installations of UV on UVC lighting would need to be outside of direct uh, contact with people, in which case they would have to be sort of at the ceiling level, shining at the ceiling. And, and it, it takes quite a lot of effort for the installer to actually go around the whole classroom and, and ensure that there is no direct exposure to any human beings internally. Um, we have seen some light fittings coming out with UV uh, lighting, which is quite scary, taking into account that the overall damage could be higher uh, than the COVID itself. That's all. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Um, I just want to provide some view on the Philips purifiers, for example, in terms of how often it cleans the airs around two times per hour. Um, so. It, it doesn't move the air, it goes through three filters and pulls out the 99.7% of particulate matter. And if we're talking about virus, um, uh, the known uh, size is about 50 to 140 nanometers and uh, we can, a purifier can take out three nanometer, uh, down to three nanometer size of particles. So 
I completely agree uh, in it needs to be taken into account in terms of a total intervention plan it's not the only solution um, but I do agree with Simon's point that it is an effective measure for indoor air um, now the reason why we built a framework is to ensure that um, there are actions that all schools can do now so where um, budget and uh, resource come into question um, as, as in terms of what's available for uh, some, most schools, um, there are things like uh, what's in their power to do right now and uh, what is a longer term solution that the LEAs and the government may need to consider as, uh, you know, helping support on. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to come in on that point in particular. All right, that's brilliant, Gemma. Thank you very much. Now, we haven't got much long to, longer to go, and I've got a long list. Um, what I'm going to ask is if Paul Waldeck and Kirsty Pringle and Gary Cottle could come in with sort of three quick questions, that would be good. Paul, are you there? If thanks, thanks Gerard. Um, yeah, it's just a, more more of a point, really. If you if you do overlay the um, air pollution index maps with the COVID case like COVID nineteen case maps, direct correlation, scarily so. So the points are well made earlier on, Garant. Um, um, there, there is a lot of misinformation about on the subject of germicidal ultraviolet light as well. By the way, we've heard a, a flavour of that there today. Um, there's extensive research on the if, if, if efficacy of UV intervention in terms of treating air um, and also better filtration systems. And there's, there's a lot of engineering papers around as well as scientific papers. So it's just a point really, Gareth, thank you. That's great, Paul, that's very helpful. Kirsty Pringle. Hi, thanks for the session. My question was how you um, calculate the change in working memory as a result of exposure to air pollution, whether that's something that's been done kind of through um, through research studies or, or how you came up with that correlation. Does anyone want to answer that quickly? I can come in on that. Um, so we used existing studies that use proxies of work and memory and the, the paper that I presented today is available through GAP website. So all of the information is, is contained on there if you want to have a look on that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Excellent. You heard that from Luke here first. Excellent. Gary Cottle. Hi there, Grant. Uh, mine's really an offer, and we uh, I sit on a bunch of a, a board of schools, so several schools. I, I also happen to coincidentally run a, a software company. So one of the things in the framework may already be considering it is to do if each school, and I have suggested this to a bunch of schools, uh, spent a few hundred pounds or, or were given, you could monitor indoor air quality in the worse area, and you could monitor outdoor air quality in the worse area. The sensors are only a few hundred pounds each, and you can do that in real time and compare almost every school in every location you'd want to do. So that's very easy to do today to convert a theoretical conversation about air quality to real time data on all of it. Well, that's excellent, Gary. Uh, I don't know whether uh, someone could, um, Chris or someone, you know, we could t take up that offer. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, public opinion, obviously it's getting out there, but the more parents outside schools and to knows what, know what the, you know, the, the levels are, whether they're risky, the more they're gonna, you know, bang on the door, local authorities and local politicians. I know local authorities in very difficult position because they haven't got the, the sort of money and uh, the environment bill's trying to throw the ball at them. But we really do need to get this, sort of people power up and running and that requires the data at, at the, the school point about anything else that's very helpful um now who i got sheila watson and um have i had gary cottle i can't consider right is sheila about i've got gary oh we just had gary have we? sorry i've been yeah. a list of sheila I, watson that memorable. Yeah. sorry sorry gary <laughs> can we have is sheila about or martin louder no, I just spoke in the panel. So I, oh, think I don't know what I'm going wrong. I just, sorry, have we got, is there anybody else who's in the list? I'm sure that um, uh, Gareth, we have, um, capable than me. Here she is. We have Wilfred Jenkins on the list. Yeah, let's have them then. Well done, Christiana. She knows what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Wilfred, are you there? Oh, no. <laughs> no, not even him. Have you, you got anyone else? Um, uh, we've so... got Mark. Mark Ottolini. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, 
given me um, uh, um, the last minutes of uh, of this event. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, comment on the point that was uh, made earlier about uh, ventilation and the use of uh, air cleaning uh, equipment. Uh, I think the comment that was made uh, by uh, by Tom was uh, was correct that uh, the number of air changes per hour is important, but it doesn't mean everything because it's also about the penetration that air cleaning devices have into a room. Uh, you can easily have a significant number of air changes per hour, but still having dead zones in that same room where uh, either pollution or uh, airborne coronavirus can accumulate. And so uh, I think there is still a lot of misunderstanding about what are the key metrics to determine uh, how you can keep the air inside the classroom safe. Um, I see from many different countries uh, guidelines and recommendations, and it shocks me uh, how ill-informed those are, and those come from the, the authorities. So I think there's definitely a need for 